In this video, I'm gonna cover some common research methods used in psychology. Okay, the first research method we've got is the experiment. And experiments are research designs in which scientists try to control every possible variable, and then they change one thing, and that one thing's called the independent variable. And they change that one thing to see what the effect of it is. So a simple experiment we could do as an example is to test the effect of caffeine on sleep. We could get two groups of people and give group A some coffee and give group B nothing. If coffee is the only difference between these groups and we see a difference in their sleep outcomes, then we know that the coffee did something, or we can say that the independent variable had an effect. The strength of experiments is their ability to establish this cause and effect relationship between two variables. The weakness of experiments is that sometimes they don't really reflect real world conditions. And if your research doesn't represent the real world very well, then you can't really generalize the results. All right, there's a lot more to it than that, but the next video is entirely about experiments, so we'll just save it for then. Up next, we've got correlational studies. These studies measure the relationship between two variables without manipulating them at all. And if we say there's a correlation between two things, it just means there's some kind of a relationship between them. What we are not saying is that a change in one will cause a change in the other. If you wanna know that, you have to do an experiment. Correlations can either be positive or negative. If a correlation is positive, then as variable A goes up, variable B will also go up. If it's a negative correlation, then as variable A goes up, variable B will go down. An example of a positive correlation could be time spent running and cardiovascular health. If you go out and run more, you're probably gonna have a healthier heart. And an example of a negative correlation could be coffee consumed and time spent asleep. You know, drink more coffee, sleep less. The good thing about correlational studies is their ability to describe a relationship between variables, which then allows researchers to make predictions and plan new experiments. Their weakness is, again, that you can't establish a cause and effect relationship just using correlational data. Okay, one other problem with these studies is something called the third variable problem. This problem arises when a third variable is affecting the relationship between the first two variables that you're looking at. For example, if we look at the sales of winter coats and the sales of ice cream cones, there's a very strong negative correlation between those two things. As people buy more winter coats, they tend to buy less ice cream cones. So what is this mysterious third variable? Well, I'm sure you've already guessed it. It's the temperature outside. All right, up next, we've got survey research. And survey research involves collecting data through questionnaires or interviews. The strength of survey research is that it allows people to gather large amounts of data really quickly and efficiently. And you can use surveys to study a really wide range of topics, and they're really cheap. Now, the weakness of survey research is that the accuracy of the data depends on the honesty of the respondents. It's a self-report measure, and sometimes people don't say exactly what they think, even if they're saying it anonymously. Okay, another thing that can cause problems with surveys is something called wording effects. And this is what happens when a researcher asks a question in a way that biases the answer. For example, I could ask you, how much do you love country music? By even answering that, you'd be acknowledging that you love country music to a certain degree which has injected some bias into your response. Okay, moving on, naturalistic observations. Naturalistic observations involve observing behavior in its natural setting without manipulating any variables. One big problem in researching behavior is that people act differently when you watch them. This is such a common problem that there's even a name for it. It's called the Hawthorne effect. Naturalistic observations can help fix that problem if they're done covertly, meaning secretly. The strength of this type of research is that it allows researchers to study behavior in real world settings. Remember the weakness of experiments? This is the strength of naturalistic observation. Now the weakness of naturalistic observations is that it's hard to control for certain variables, which if you remember was a strength of an experiment. And one other problem with naturalistic observation is sometimes there's ethical concerns that stem from observing people without their knowledge or consent. But these studies can be really useful, and a great example of this type of research was done by developmental psychologist Jean Piaget. He would observe children of different ages playing. Then based on the differences he observed between those age groups, he could draw conclusions about the level of cognitive development of those children. Okay, next we've got case studies. Case studies involve an in-depth analysis of an individual group or an event. And the strength of case studies is that they can provide rich, detailed information 
about a rare situation or some complex circumstance. Case studies can also be used to generate hypotheses for further research. Okay, an example of a case study. It's a little bit dark, but traumatic brain injuries are actually great examples of case studies. For example, there was a man named Phineas Gage who had part of his frontal lobe destroyed in a work accident. After that, his personality changed significantly. He became pretty aggressive and he eventually lost his job because of it. So as a result of that, psychologists were able to figure out what the frontal lobe does. Okay, and the weakness of case studies is, like I said, hard to generalize and you usually can't replicate them. Like for example, it'd be pretty unethical to put someone through a work experiment and destroy part of their frontal lobe just to recreate Phineas Gage's situation. All right, up next we've got longitudinal studies. Longitudinal studies involve studying the same group of individual over an extended period of time. The strength of longitudinal studies is that they can reveal developmental trends and changes in behavior over a long period of time. The weakness is that they're often really expensive and really time consuming to conduct. Like these things can take decades to finish. And when you do research that lasts that long, you're gonna have the issue of people dropping out. As an example of a longitudinal study, we could look at the long-term effects of smoking on lung health. To do this study, we might recruit a group of 100 smokers and 100 non-smokers, and then follow them for like 10 years. During that time, we would check in every now and then and collect data on various measures of lung health, like lung capacity, respiratory symptoms, or the incidence of lung disease. And in the end, if we find a difference between the groups, we would have a really strong evidence about the impact of smoking on health. Okay, but let's imagine that you don't want to wait 10 years for that data. You want instant results. If that's what you're looking for, then cross-sectional studies might be what you want. So cross-sectional studies involve collecting data from a sample of individuals at one point in time. It's called a cross-sectional design because it involves dividing your sample into different categories, like age groups, for example. The strength of cross-sectional studies is that they're pretty quick and easy, and they give you a good snapshot of a behavior at a specific point in time. The weakness of cross-sectional studies is that, like correlational research, you cannot establish a cause and effect relationship just using that data. So as an example, let's explore the same question about smoking and health. What we need to do is we need to get groups of people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and so on. And then we would gather data on whether or not they smoke. And then we could also collect data on how healthy they are. In a single day, basically, we would generate data that would almost certainly show the negative impact that smoking can have on your health as you age. And you won't have to wait 10 years. Okay, that is all we've got for these different research methods. And in the next video, we're gonna do an in-depth look at experiments.